Animal Crossing basically one lockdown, you know, everybody was playing that. Same here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to find out um, how your work, all of you, fits into that larger scene of non-violent video game output. The work for hire that we do, a lot of the projects that we pick out are what we kind of see as games for good, right? It's kind of what, what we look at it. And there's a few key ones, and one in particular was just launched called Venture Valley, which is a great example, right? So it was built um, in conjunction with an American charity called the Singleton Foundation. And one of their really big focuses about promoting financial literacy, right? So helping you know, um, children and people as they move into college to kind of understand finances and managing their finances. And if they were to then go into business, you know, how would they uh, kind of go about doing that, right? And so they, they wanted to develop this game called Venture Valley that is a game that uses, you know, game design principles. It's a city builder, a strategy game at, at heart, but really the, the intent is to then teach people about financial literacy and help them kind of understand uh, that, that those sorts of ideas and it's tied into then the chart the sort of donations that the charity makes to various colleges and and sort of sponsorship in regards to um scholarships and things like that so there's a huge component there that kind of helps people move from the game and then into um actual sort of higher education and things like that so that's kind of how our, our work for hire fits in and then our oip um they're part of what we sort of see is the broader wholesome games market right so games that really want to put a focus on kind of storytelling and games that kind of have a greater sense of purpose, I think, in, in what they want to say, right? They're, they're entertainment games, you know, they're, they're fun, they're games, and that's always a really core component, but they have an element of story to them that kind of touches on, you know, maybe more sensitive areas of, of you know, sort of emotion or kind of life experience and things like that. So Pine Hearts, one of the games that we're building at the moment, is about a character who's lost their father recently, right? And it's about them kind of coming to terms with that loss and understanding their character growth and how that develops over the course of the game. And it's still very much a lighthearted puzzle game, you know, that's very accessible, but it does have these themes underneath it that players, if they want to engage in, can kind of scratch away and find those, those kind of deeper meanings that we hope, you know, make that game a little more enriching, right, than if it was sort of just a, a puzzle game or, or something like that. So... Um, that's kind of how our two sides of the business kind of fit into that that sort of sphere. Excellent. And what about you, Lucy, with, with what you do at Media uh, Molecule, Molecule, sorry, how does that fit into the larger scene of non-violent video game output? Well, um, all of Media Molecule's output in some way has been related to creativity, which, uh, and what's more non-violent than creativity, really. Um, the act of creation is something that, you know, we've always been really, really interested in the Media Molecule and of empowering people, our players, to create themselves. The creation stuff in Dreams, I mean, the, the community recently has just, you know, gone into the stratosphere with the sort of stuff that they're producing. Um, the Impies, which is coming up on Sunday, plug plug, um, is uh, just an entirely joyful explosion of creativity and people, you know, presenting their their insights to the world, if you know what I mean, what's going on in their head. Do you think, Jude, that non-violent video games get enough credit in the industry today? I think, yeah, I think they do. I think there's, you know, there's very few video games that are, are violent. It's just, I guess, you know, the, some of the more violent ones have got big budgets and that's what people see. It kind of goes back to this movement of consumer buying behavior. Um, people are choosing to, to buy products and services that are more impact driven or and maybe they are choosing less violent as well. I mean, I saw there was a, a really good statistic last year um, during when we were in you know, proper lockdown um, that talked about um, you know, the, the sales of violent video games had gone down because people had felt that life was just so stressful enough that they didn't want to be more stressed out while playing. Um, so they were choosing more social games, more um, well, less violent games. So I think that that could have a big impact on, on the types of games that we play. Um, I think there will always be kind of an element of violent video games there. You know, it's, it's down to personal choice, what you enjoy playing. But um, I think we'll start to see much more you know, either games developed with a, um, with a more kind of ethical lens um, or content within existing games um, that uh, kind of promotes other kind of 
uh, impact will be weaved into it as well. Um, Lucy, um, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about the community and creativity and, and this like that's this burst of awesomeness that you're seeing. Um, so there's clearly a demand for non-violent video games. Do you see that increasing over time or do you think it's just a fad because perhaps it's just a generational thing at the moment? What do you think? What's your take on it? No, I definitely see it increasing. I mean, um, the lockdown effect is definitely, I, th I think, has had an effect on people. Um, Animal Crossing basically won lockdown, you know, everybody was playing that. Same here. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I, I, my, I've got an 18 year old daughter and I noticed that she, like she'll play shooty games and violent games as much as anybody. But the thing that she loves is creating stuff, you know, um, whether it's Sims, which she's obsessed with. Um, or um, trying to think what else. Oh, she still plays Minecraft at 18 year, years old, you know, because she just likes making a world um, and hanging out there with her pals, right? Uh, and I don't see, it's not, I don't, I don't see any, that becoming less of a thing really, you know, um, particularly as let's face it, the world is, you know, not the best place right now. Um, I think people want escapes that don't remind them of the rubbish that's going on outside their own front door, you know. Um, I think people want to, they want to collaborate with people, they want to connect with people on the other side of the world, they want to, you know, just get as much joy as they can out of life. So I think it's only going to build and build and build. I think that the, the, the uh, appetite for stuff that just makes you think or create or relax is just only going to build, really. Absolutely, I agree. Um, especially as a big Minecraft fan, uh, won't give away my age. I'm definitely older than eighteen. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Rob, um, do you think that? I mean, just generally speaking, like there, there's definitely a demand. You know, having spoken to everyone here for uh, non-violent video games, and I definitely play a lot of non-violent video games myself. Um, I mean, do you think they get enough credit? Do you think the indies, do you think the non-violent video games, do you think that all of that needs to get more credit, more press, that we should be sure to get more about it, Rob? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's certainly not going to hurt for sure. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's definitely, I guess for a situation like us, you know, where a lot of your getting a game to market route sometimes has to revolve around, well, now we need to pitch this to a publisher, right? Now this needs to we need to have someone help us bring this to market, either through funding or through distribution and, you know, marketing and things like that. And, you know, the, the more success stories you're able to point to, then the more persuasive your argument can be, right? And that's only going to then help more of those stories get out. And it just kind of snowballs from there, right? So, you know, if, if we're able to to kind of push that and, and have games, you know, non-violent games take more of a stage in, in the in the industry, then it's only going to help more of those those stories come forward, right? And and publishers will be willing to take more of a risk, you know, on, on a market that might not be as big as the, the the shooter or the racer market or whatever, right? You know, your your Call of Duties and you know your annual releases in those sense, right? You're you're not needing to compete with them. There's a there's a defined market that enjoys those games and you can really point to them and say, look, there's this many people that would like to, to buy this game. And so this is a really viable proposition, you know. Um, so no, I think that that can only help. But no, I can only echo what what Judy and Lucia said, I think there's there's never been more appetite for for these sorts of products, and I don't think that's going anywhere. It's only getting bigger and bigger, as you know, as especially as, as as games become more accessible as well. You know, just the way that platforms and technology has been so democratized. You know, you can play a game on your phone, and then on your PC, and then on your your Switch, and it's the same game, and it's the consistent experience throughout. You know, that's only going to bring more people in, and then I think as that happens, then you just get more. A more sort of a variety of, of experiences right how has the industry changed would you say um from when you started and you made your first steps leaving Aberty to now how would you say it's changed for you i mean it's it's grown hugely um mm -hmm. it's first i think it's i think the perception of gaming has changed as well it's no longer kind of niche and geeky it's for everyone um, of all ages um, you know it's not a particular type of person that plays a game now it's everyone so I think that's been a massive change and I think how games are being used and applied outside of being entertainment games as well has really grown so 
um, when I started off kind of in the first the first spin out um, at Abertay, I think people just thought we were crazy, just thought we were mental. They were like, uh, why are you trying to teach people to learn through games? You know, it wasn't really a, a body of research. It, it was quite early days. The area that we focus on as well, which is the impact side, you know, even 10 years ago and kind of setting up Playmob, um, you know, we were, you know, people kind of look at us and kind of go, well, are you a charity because you're doing good or are you a company? It's like, no, we're a profit with purpose business. Um, and when we were going out to talk to game developers, it was CSR and impact wasn't really on, um, it was on a few people's radars, but not many. Um, whereas now, I mean, that's just exploded as well. You know, how can you engage your players and making a difference because players, consumers want that too. Um, so I think there's been a huge change in um, consumer attitudes and spending um, behaviours that have also influenced what we do in the games industry as well. How do you all begin planning your games? Do you start with the goal? Do you work backwards? I, I've got no idea. So. Uh, Rob, how do you begin planning your games if it's not a client thing and it's your game that you're starting yourself? Where where do you start? How do you yeah, start? For sure, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, we the way that we kind of approach it is we always like to start with a theme, right? There's, I think the way that we want to make games is that we need to say something with the game. There needs to be a kind of purpose to it. Um, there needs to be some sort of moral argument or something that we're trying to communicate. And so we always try and establish that theme of like, well, what's the emotional takeaway from this experience before we even understand what the game mechanically is going to be? It's like we want to understand what we want to kind of express. Um, and I think that's really important because you can use that to just facilitate so much decision making in the game, because um, I think it's really easy to, to kind of fall into a trap where you you think mechanically, okay, this is the game we're building, and then you just look to other games, and then you just automatically start putting in features from other games, yeah. um, and that can be really helpful because you don't want to reinvent the wheel in a lot of cases. But you know, if you start with theme, then you can start to think about, well, you know, before we put this feature in, let's think is it actually suitable or not. You know, does this facilitate our theme, or does this, you know, damage it in some way? And then that can actually let you make some really creative decisions where you maybe don't include something that you might expect from that sort of genre trope, right? Or you you augment that feature in some way that makes it communicate your theme better. Um, so that's where we always start. And then from there, you know, it's just about bringing the team in and making sure that everyone feels like they understand what it is that we're building and getting their input. You know, we're a very collaborative studio, so it's all about making sure that everyone really gets to put their stamp on the game um, and really gets to feel like they have a sense of ownership and an understanding of what they're their part in it is so um and then from there it just becomes a you know matter of planning and executing and just figuring out what our budgets and our teams are going to look like and we kind of build from there but i think the most exciting part for me is that initial establishment of what are we actually trying to say right why are we building this game oh 100 because as a gamer you know you can feel that when you're playing yeah you, know, you can 100 you, you i sometimes go to bed thinking about the themes of a game and thinking mm -hmm. about a game and you get really obsessed with that element not just you know the mechanics of things all the time yeah. so it's interesting 